Welcome to part two of what may actually turn out to be a three-part series. All right, so I need to make an awkward transition here uh, into the middle of the deck. So now I need to talk to you about getters and setters um, because it leads to a really deep insight. So the f first place, um, we're back in Swift context here. Okay, so the first place that they show up is in computed properties. Um, so here uh, I've got a mathematical vector with x and y, uh, and these are called stored properties, right? Stored doubles. Um, and now I also want to expose the polar form of this vector. So uh, I can create computer properties R and theta. So uh, what you see inside of R is the get clause is the getter, right? That's the thing that computes the new value uh, and or computes the, the current value. And the setter here is what sets the value, okay? Don't worry about the math. I think it's right. I didn't check. Um, this new value that you see here is the standard default identifier for the incoming value for setters. Um, so you, there's a way to override it, but it's not really important. Um, okay, so theta is basically the same thing, right? Different math. And here's theta in use. We make a, a vec2 of 1, 1, and we get the angle, and that's pi over 4, so I multiply by 4, and I got pi. So I think it's right. All right. Um, Good. So now I'm going to collapse these two just to make some space for the next thing. So it can be really useful when you have a vector like this to be able to refer to the different dimensions by some index. So this is how we do subscripts, right? And so we're subscripting to get either x or y, depending on what the index value is. And as you can see, whoop, sorry, it's, ah, uh, yes. I'm not good at this. Computers. As you can see, uh, it's got the same form as the, uh, as the property. Uh, welcome, come on in. Uh, right, so subscripts use getters and setters too. Subscripts are just basically properties with uh, parameters, okay? <laughs> okay, so yes. Yeah. Yeah, I had some concerns about that, but we checked it. It, it works. works. Yeah. Does this ah, okay. Like, sorry, does this imply that you can update R without updating theta? Is that a meaningful optimal reason? Well, yeah, you can update R without updating theta. Um, the theta is it meaningful? Sure. If you if you like the polar representation, it makes the vector longer, right? That's the R is the length of the vector, and and you know it's a little funky because floating point and when you when you update R theta is going to change a little bit maybe, but but in principle it works. Okay, if you guys are going to talk though, you got to whisper. All right, all right, because we don't have a lot of time. All right, <laughs> so the subscript. Just a property with a parameter, okay. So let's look at a use, okay. Um, dictionaries have subscripts, you can subscript on keys. Um, and what I've done here is extended the standard library string type. I don't know if I mentioned this, but all types in Swift that have a name can be extended like this, and uh, that includes int. And no types really have special status uh, in the language, which is really good for generic programming. Um, okay, so here's subscripting in action. Um, it happens inside this extension. Right, and so what we're going to do is compute a histogram of the occurrences of characters in a string. So histogram, that just means we'll count the number of occurrences of each character that, that occurs, okay? And this may not be the, the uh, this is not the most compact way to do it, but um, it, uh, it helps us get to the point, okay? So this thing returns a dictionary, 
Dictionary is just a, a hash map in C++ terms. OK. Um, create an empty one. Iterate all of the characters in self, which is the, the string, right? And then this is very similar to the C++ uh, map indexing operator, except here you're explicit about what default gets, gets used, OK? Um, so just build the dictionary and put this in. Now this is John McCall, Swift's sort of uh, language theorist. Um, he was thinking about this example, and he, uh, he noticed a performance problem. OK, since, uh, since all we have to express this uh, are getters and setters, what happens here when we update this value? Well, what happens is two hash lookups. This is sort of like the code that gets generated, right? One to do the get, and then we lost all the information about where in the hash table we were, and another one to do the set. OK, so this is clearly not a good model. But John also knew that there was a way to avoid that extra work if you have the right methods on dictionary. So he got to thinking. And if you have this modify method on dictionary, which I'll walk you through, um, you can do it without, without the extra lookups. So this just takes the same pair of parameters that, uh, that indexing does, right? Plus a closure to process the value. And it takes it in out so it can mutate it, right? And so what it's going to do is find that location and then, and then pass that value in out to uh, to the closure, right? So we find it, or insert it if it didn't exist, and then change it. Clear? No questions. Good. OK, so then what you have to do, obviously, is rewrite this to use that, that function, OK? Uh, now, I don't know if I, yeah, I didn't spend any time showing you, but uh, yeah, this is, this is a uh, closure uh, in Swift syntax, but it should look pretty obvious. Yes? Is applying like a special keyword here? No. Oh, OK. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have time to cover this. Um, I'll try to go over it quickly. This is a feature in Swift called argument labels. Um, argument labels are not uh, what you think of uh, in Python where you, where you have named parameters. It's actually a label that's separate from the parameter name. And, uh, and when it's present in the signature, it's mandatory. And this, this colon is actually an extremely important design feature. You, you might not think it at first, but there's a lot of times where your code is a lot more expressive if you're not putting a noun here. And the only thing that makes sense when, you're, when you have an equal sign is a noun. So if you ever do named parameters or something like this for C++, Think about colon. All right. <clears throat> All right, so I'm making some space. Uh, so John thought, you know, it would be nice not to make the user rewrite their, their modification like this. It's, you know, this passing the closure, it's cumbersome and, and ugly. So what he decided to do was add a new kind of accessor called modify. OK. And what we do is we just, We'll just transplant the body of this thing into modify. OK, it's got the same parameters, right? So this finds our inserts. And well, we don't have a change, an identifier change in scope. I suppose we could have done the same thing as we do with new value and just made a default name for the, for the closure. But instead, John wanted to acknowledge the inversion of control that's inherent here, right? And so he said, Let's rewrite that as a yield. OK? Um, so that's, that's just syntax, really. OK? Um, and once you've done that, you can get back your original syntax at the source. OK? Um, so this, this generates code like that, right? Index the thing called the modify accessor. And it translates this expression into a closure. Cool? OK. 
Um, so um, this transformation is really super powerful. So for example, we have a slicing subscript in Swift for all, for all collections, OK? And so what we're doing here is we're slicing x. We're taking everything but the first and last element, and we're sorting those in place. OK, let's look at how that works. So, <clears throat> so here, inside the modify accessor, we create an array slice. That's a different type than array. Right? It doesn't exist anywhere in memory at the time the slice starts. Right? So this is not like something you do with a subscript that returns uh, a reference in C++. Right? You, you just produce a new object. And then it gets yielded. And then after the yield, we get a chance to not only the implicit destruction of this slice can execute, but in this case, there's some, you know, the slice can be resized. And if it does, then, the, then it doesn't have the same buffer as the original, and we have to actually move elements back. So you get an opportunity to, um, to actually update the, the source, right? They might not have even had any connection. OK. Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't be able to do this with references in C++. And as we all, I hope, know, proxies don't work. Um, so because this slice is holding bits of the array, uh, it can't last past the scope of the mutation. So uh, closure captures uh, definitely bring up lifetime issues. Right? This is essentially using a closure. OK, so let's talk about closure captures. Back to our vector. Um, so what I've done is taken out the old guts and replaced them with a couple of functions, an apply function that passes each dimension through a closure, and a scale function that uses the apply function. Okay, So there's, there's apply. It takes a, a double to double. Uh, closure, transforms both of the indices, scale, well, the, yes, sorry? Uh, uh, function argument list, okay. returns, return type, okay? Um, sorry, that's, that's kind of uh, across a lot of languages these days, that's kind of a standard notation for, for function types, okay? So scale takes a double, um, this factor, right? And then it uses factor inside of a closure. So that's, that's a capture, right? Um, now let's look at an, another example that's very different. OK, so this is action queue, right? So action queue is just built around a, a uh, collection of closures. That's an array of closures, right? Um, what just happened? Come back. OK. Yeah, it's, that's a strange animation. OK, are we gonna, OK, there's my array of closures. Um, great, we can cut that out and post. Um, <laughs> OK. So first thing, we have this inject method that sticks a new closure in that array of actions. And uh, yeah, we're just depending it. And then the initializer for action queue, for whatever reason, sorry, this is a bad example. Um, for whatever reason, the first thing it does uh, is to inject a, a closure that prints its identifier uh, into the, into the uh, uh, action queue. Okay, so the first action for it, for any action queue, is to print out its identifier. Um, and you see again, we've got a we've got a parameter here that's getting captured inside of a closure, right? But this one is very different. See, on the, on the left here, we're all done with transform after this, right? We just call it, and it's, it's over. Um, over here, we store A, right? So it lives past the lifetime of the call, OK? Um, <coughs> so what that means is 
this value, id, has to be persisted somehow. Right? Um, now, you might notice that these closure types don't include the type of the captures. Right? So this is, these are not like a C++ lambda. A closure type is, a, is like a STD function in that sense. Right? But we didn't want to pay the cost of STD function for every one of these. The one on the left doesn't need it. Right? So what ended up happening was there was this annotation added to note that this value is escaping. Right? So it escapes the, the scope of this function. This function ends, and this value is still alive. Right? And I'm pointing this out because this turns out to be a very important factor in the whole value semantics story that's often overlooked. And we actually have like a habit of acknowledging it now in C++ by passing by our value reference, right? But it's, we don't always think that it's, it's not about whether it's going to be moved. It's about the fact that the value has to escape, right? OK. Um, uh, so also, if I had this same information about C++ coroutines, for example, I could make a local coroutine and not have to allocate any memory for its, its locals, right? as long as it didn't escape. OK. OK. Now, the other, the other wonderful thing I wanted to talk about, generic programming. Um, so in, in part, this is, so, <laughs> so I want to I shake you guys a little bit because I know from having been there, you're living in an extremely C++ world, most of you. Most of you ha haven't done generic programming in a few other languages are. And, and it's, it can be very different. And in fact, you know, it's kind of boring. Uh, this is a fantastic talk that Sean and I uh, are going to hold a watch party for later uh, in the conference. Uh, just send mail to sparent at adobe.com and let them know that you're interested, and we will get you to it, OK? Um, so it's a really fantastic talk. But uh, anyway, Alex laid out the basics of what you need for language support for generic programming. This is full 20 years ago. And you know the simple, the simple explanation is it's like Java interfaces plus associated types. Right, Java interfaces are like pure, you know, abstract classes that have only pure virtual functions, right? But that's the that's the dynamic dispatch idea, right? We use them with static dispatch, but in terms of notionally what they are, they're just interfaces plus associated types. Okay, um, and a key thing, like the first thing that Alex talks about, is that generics need to be type checked, which is something we still don't have in C++ with concepts as they came into the language. Okay? And, and I hold little hope for ever getting it because of the valid expression uh, way that the requirements are expressed. I, catch me after if you, if you want an explanation of why that, that fails, but you can just sort of think of all of the implicit conversions that you're allowed to use and then putting those into context in real code, uh, it can fall apart. All right. Anyway, um, Alex also talked about you know, uh, what he calls late binding. You know, it's just what we call dynamic dispatch. And Alex you know, is not opposed to dynamic dispatch. Alex says, you know, it's a wonderful thing. We ought to be able to do that with our, uh, with our concepts. <coughs> And, you know, this is not rocket science. I mean, I probably missed a few languages that have basically done this. OK? Um, this is, it's not hard. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, so remember the, the Alex watch party? Send Sean an email. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to ask you to cast your mind back. I know you're all template jocks and really good at, at like pouring through those, those layers of error messages and everything. Um, but 
just think back, and if you're if you're a young person, think to a different language that you might have been using, like maybe when you programmed in Java, okay, when uh, <coughs> when you know a time before Svina, subsumption, ADL, two phase name lookup, um, instantiation backtraces, and especially before template metaprogramming, okay, uh, when you would describe the requirements of your interfaces using normal looking function signatures right that's that's an interface yeah pretty normal and and when it wasn't too much trouble to explicitly declare the interfaces that you intended to implement right and you know what was really great about that the compiler could tell you when your implementation of those interfaces was lacking. This is C++ code, right? You guys, you guys all recognize this. Have you, have, do you guys program like this these days? Some of you, sometimes? OK. But, but not when you're doing generic programming, right? You don't get this experience from generic programming. Uh, in fact, you know, the compiler might even decide to help you with some suggestions if you got one of them fancy IDEs, right? <laughs> I don't believe in IDEs, debuggers. 40 characters is all you need. All right. Um, so, uh, right. So, and even, you know, you might label your type final and get some help about, about uh, you know, what methods you need to implement, right? You didn't, didn't implement the whole parts of the, you know all the parts required for sender and you know that fix it you know in Xcode you you click that and it puts in the the missing bits right you're ready to write it and you know these are these are trivial things but this is you shouldn't have to worry about this stuff right programming is hard enough our tools should be able to support us like this all right um, of course, we can't do this in C++ because you can't use final on a class. Sorry, <coughs> but you get the idea. Um, okay. Not in the standard. Not not on any compiler I was able to find. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. We can't have nice things in C++. That's good. <laughs> Just in the wrong order. We do it di we'll do it differently from every other language, you know, but that's fine. All right. Um, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is, what it, this is what some generic programming looks like in Swift. And I'm going to take you through, you know, this is a, a cursory tour through the major features. Okay. So this is an integer protocol. And the idea here is that, uh, <clears throat> right? So a protocol is just Swift's name for a concept, right? And, uh, and in here, whatever you put in the body of your protocol, the main declaration, are the customization points that you get with that protocol, all right? That, that's somewhat limited for generic programming. We'll address that, but, um, but yeah. That's how that works. Um, so first we have an associated type, spelled associated type, believe it or not, right? A magnitude. So that's, a, that's an integer, an, an unsigned integer that can represent the uh, absolute value of any value of this, right? Because in two's complement, the, the lowest minimum value, if you want to take the absolute value, you need to represent that as an unsigned. So this is an excerpt of the protocol in Swift that we use for, for integers. There's a lot more going on. OK. And an absolute value function is required. Yes? Is unsigned integer itself a protocol? Yeah. Yes, it is. And I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, yeah. So magnitude has to conform to unsigned integer, right? OK. Um, and this is what's known in Swift as protocol inheritance. And before I watch that video with 
with Alex, who said inheritance is a wonderful thing. It's just not, not you know, the way we do it in, in C++ and Java. Um, uh, before that, I was a snob about saying protocol refinement because I'd always heard concept refinement, but now I'm fine with the Swift term protocol inheritance. Okay, um, and uh, and this is a declaration of a unary minus operator. Please don't worry about the details of that syntax. There's it's irrelevant to the point of the talk. All right, we can talk after if you have questions. <laughs> okay, and now here is a conformance of int to signed integer. Right, so all types are extensible. We extend int to conform to signed integers. And this is a post hoc conformance. So this could appear anywhere separate from the declaration of int, even in your own module. Uh, if for some reason the standard library had failed to make your integer a signed integer, uh, you could do this yourself. Okay? And we're saying, uh, right, the, I'll just back up one. We're saying the magnitude for int is uint, and here's an implementation of the absolute value function. Okay, and I guess that's a, that's a broken implementation. <laughs> I designed this whole system so that we wouldn't do this, but I did that. Okay, so I negated, I negated the minimum int value. So it's a little more complicated to implement it right. Not much. Okay, <clears throat> we did this. So, unsigned integer. This just refines integer, right? Um, and notice there's nothing in the body. It's not adding any new requirements, but here, it would in reality, but here we've got a protocol extension, okay? So we're gonna extend it and put some things in the body there. Now, what goes in a protocol extension are default implementations. Right, so those are not the customization points, but, but uh, you know, if you decide to conform to that protocol but don't provide these, these are the implementations you get, and these are appropriate for any unsigned integer. Okay, um, <coughs> but suppose we wanted to do different abs, for example, wanted to log the fact that we were doing absolute value of a, a uint, um, we could supply that for for you in, right? Okay. That overrides the default. Okay, so those are the basic features. These are the advanced features, okay? I think this is like compared to what you do, you know, on a daily basis with C++, this is really trivial, but I think you'll see that. Okay, um, so serializable protocol, right? A serializable thing can be written into an archive. And we're extending array to conform to serializable whenever its element is serializable. It would be nice to be able to do that. Yeah, we, we left out the implementation and the compiler would complain because there's no implementation of write here, right? But we can, we can add that, right? So write into destination, we just write the count and then we iterate over the elements, writing them into the destination, right? Yeah. Now, the, the thing that, that may have, may escape notice is that this is a generic function, and there are no angle brackets. <laughs> and you would be amazed at how much difference that makes to making generic programming accessible, right? There, there definitely are generic functions where you have to write angle brackets. But there's a huge class that you can write just as methods that are extensions on generic types or other ways. I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here is an excerpt of the collection protocol from the Swift standard library. Um, so a collection is a sequence, ignore sequence. It's a, it's a single pass thing that we can't represent in Swift really well. Um, so it's a disaster. I made some real mistakes. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Should go through this, right? So it has an associated index and element type 
and uh, a subscript that you can subscript on the index, uh, start index and end index. So this should seem really familiar from you know, C++ forward ranges. I want you to note, though, that this index thing is, is super powerful. Um, for one thing, it, it, allows, it gives you a place where the, the collection can uh, do type checking, I mean, do range checking, for example, before you actually do the dereference. So if you want to have safety, that's there. But also, there's no constant, non-constant iterators. You know the giant explosion of overloads that you have in C++ for constant, non-constant? It avoids it. Um, so mutability is controlled by the collection, not by the, the index. All right. Um, so array is a collection. OK, moving forward. Here is an extension on collection that's conditional, right? We're saying every collection that has an equatable element gets this find algorithm. This is basically your C++ style find, okay? So that's yet another generic function, right? A generic function over collections with equatable elements. Okay, what does a real generic algorithm look like? A more complicated one? Here's stable partition. Notice that it fits on one slide. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, it's got two parts. Uh, oh, that was creepy. All right, so the first part is the, you know, the, the outside part, which counts the number of elements. Yes? Yes. No, I think it's a capa it's a capability. It's not it isn't it's not logic. But maybe if I can add something, yeah, it's, sure. it's, yeah. it's important to note that it's part the part of the of the structure but not encoded in the type of the structure. If if you declare something const, then it's a const structure. If you declare something var, it's a mutable structure. So you don't have two different structures that encode the mutability. It's it's the the way you use those values that encode the mutability. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that cleans a lot of things up. Okay, so the first the first part of stable partition just forwards to the second part after counting the elements, right? And okay, so we handle the the easy cases if there's nothing in the in the uh, uh, sequence or there's there's one thing in the sequence, those cases are handled. Then eh, animations, okay. Animations aren't working here. It was a late night. Okay, so we, we divide the collection in half, right? And compute an index that's halfway through the collection. Then we slice, the, we do the left slice, we recurse on that, stable partition. We do the right slice. Okay, the slicing notation, I can tell you all about that, but later, okay? Um, uh, uh, and then, what is that thing at the end? What is that thing at the end? That's, that's a rotate. <laughs> oh my I was gosh. waiting for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was hoping somebody would help, but okay. So that's the end of the stable partition algorithm. Okay. Um, so with that, we'd like to talk a bit, a bit about the future. And Dimitri is going to come up and uh, <clears throat> tell you about a project we've been working on. Uh, it was a big deal for me when I realized that we could have pass by value semantics without actually copying anything. And pushing that idea to its limits led to this project that Dimitri is going to talk about. So everybody, please welcome my collaborator, Dimitri Racordon. And I guess we have to switch the mic. So where my sound levels are being checked, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity, so it's a bit tough to go after Dave, uh, but I tried to do my best. Um, so yeah, uh, we wanted to talk about this programming language that we've been developing, it's called VAR. Uh, so what is VAR? Uh, the basic idea behind VAR is what happens if you have a programming language that has nothing but mutable value semantics. 
Uh, and since it is um, based on Swift, uh, then other questions became um, how to improve on Swift, uh, especially with regard to non-copyable types, generics um, uh, for safe high-level systems programming, and concurrency. Um, also, Dave and I are opinionated people. Uh, if you talked with me, you probably noticed, and with Dave, you already knew. So <laughs> there, are, uh, a bunch of <laughs> there are a bunch of things we wanted to do our way uh, that, that are different from Swift. Um, some example, um, we want no type annotations for efficiency, so no steady move, anything like that. We want actual sum types. Um, I, I, I talked a bit about that yesterday uh, at Dave Sinkle's uh, uh, talk. Uh, they are just awesome, and it's better than uh, Swift enums. Uh, and no type-based overloading, because it's evil. And we'll see how we can work around that. And also, um, very simple access uh, control model. Um, I, I guess this is something we don't usually think about when we are designing programming languages, but Swift has a very complex thing, and I wanted to have something much simpler. Do you mind if I, if I clarify why type-based overloading is evil? Because I know you're not planning to talk about it. Sure. Um, so this is something I, I sort of realized as I was working on the Swift standards library. And you know, I, I documented all of, all of my functions and integrated integration with Xcode. You know, it'll, it gives you code completion and pop-up documentation for these functions. And I was thinking about, like, what's the user experience when you say, OK, I want to I want to do X to, to something, right? So you, you hit the dot and you, you write you write you know method name, and then you get a pile of six different choices that are that you you actually have to read the documentation for each one because they're all different. Yes. It's not one thing, mm -hmm. right? There and they could come from anywhere, right? This is a terrible user experience, and and you know it also causes type based overloading causes efficiency problems in the compiler too. So I started to think about, you know, is there a way for us to get all of the things that we're getting, the valuable things that we're getting from overloading without overloading? And that's why I think it's easy. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, and the biggest difference there is between Val and Swift uh, is that all copies in Val are explicit. And I mean, yes, all copies, even your integers. So you need to explicitly copy an int. Uh, but before we came to this conclusion, that might be a bit surprising, um, as they've said, uh, one big realization was um, pass by value is, can be implemented as, as pass by const reference with the right set of guarantees. And immutable bindings, so your const local variables, really they can behave just like uh, pass by value parameters. So um, maybe we can avoid copings for those as well. And I'll explore that in, in more details later. The second thing, uh, the second observation is current languages tend to copy too eagerly. Uh, actually, this is something Dave said uh, on Monday. Um, when we use pass by value in a language like C++ or Swift or Rust, Language tends to make a copy very eagerly, and maybe there's a way to delay that copy. So Swift use copy and write, and uh, we try to explore a different approach for that. And the last thing I want to mention is that copyability in Val is just uh, a single trait. So that is like a, a Swift protocol. Again, we've seen this before. And there is a single requirement for that copy method. So this is not a constructor. When you need to copy something, you just call that method. That's it. The best thing to understand, the best way to understand Val, I think, is to look at its passing conventions, what happens at function boundaries. So let me reintroduce the, vec, uh, the, the vector that Dave showed before. And here I have one uh, little addition to that vector. This is a, a static property. And a static store property is just like a global. But because it's so global, um, it needs to be immutable. Here, remember, we are talking about language that has relatively strict value semantics. So uh, a mutable global is, uh, is has mutable, uh, shared, is shared mutably. So 
I can't make that uh, a shared global, uh, vi shared viable. And yeah, I think I can skip on that. Swift has the same thing. And I will make the type copyable. That will help the compiler come up with suggestions if I uh, forget about those explicit copies that I said. Um, because all uh, stored properties form a whole path relationship by default, we can synthesize those kind of uh, uh, methods here. So copy is just copy your parts. And here, clearly, the parts of a vector are this x and y component. But if I want, uh, for whatever reason, I can also explicitly provide a method, because maybe I want to do something different. Here, I'm, I'm just doing exactly what the compiler would have done. So OK, back to the passing conventions. Uh, we have several um, conventions that are written here before the arguments. And let's look at uh, what, what they mean. So first is first, let's start with let. And since let is the default, it can be omitted. So here is an offset function for my vector, seeking uh, a vector and the offset, this d, the, the delta. And I will write three functions now. We have method in Val, but I will write three functions so we understand better what these passing conventions have uh, as an effect to the receiver. So let parameter are passed by value and are immutable in the function. That is uh, very similar to what we've seen with Swift. Um, and they can be underst uh, understood by, uh, yeah, passed by const preference with guarantees that they cannot change during the, the call. So in C++, you can think of that function, which is kind of my attempt to do on transliteration. I'm not a C++ expert. I'm really sorry if I made mistakes. I, I guess I forgot the semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have semicolons in that. Um, uh, and yeah, we have that uh, extra guarantee in, in that. So there is a kind of contract between the caller and the callee that's, that's a bit important. Uh, Sure, it's a bit trivial. Both just agree not to mutate the argument. And well, it's a function call. So how can the caller do anything? But we'll come to that uh, later. And there is an additional fine print, uh, clause in the fine print of the contract is that the argument is safe to use. So it is initialized. Uh, it's invariant hold. So here we can make all these, these assumptions. So I cannot change my function like that. That would violate the contract. Um, I cannot mutate a let parameter here, you know, because it's immutable. And so the compiler is offering uh, suggestions. Remember, my vec2 is copyable, so it, it's, it's saying, yeah, copy v to a local variable if you want to do that. So I can go ahead and just follow the suggestion. So now we have this sync here that appeared. Uh, this is a modifier that indicates syncability. Uh, and they've insisted a lot of this on this word. I'm, I'm not an English speaker, so I don't understand really why, but he said it's really great. So. Uh, the word unthinkable <laughs> is really great. Uh, OK. <laughs> anyway, I, I just said, oh, all right, fine. Uh, let's use uh, syncability and unsinkable. And, and this, this choice of keyword came from John, by the way. It's a great suggestion. So what, is, what it tells here is um, that this uh, underscore v here that is being copied can escape the function. So remember, we, we said escaping is an important thing. So syncability is really escapability. Um, and something that is unsinkable cannot escape. So that's what allows me here to return the v. I, I wouldn't be able to do that otherwise. And we'll see other uses of, of this sync later. All right. Um, here is how I can call my function. There is no special syntax to say that it's a reference. The, the whole talk about it's like a reference is just to understand what, the, what is the model for the compiler. But when I call the function, I just pass the arguments by value as if I were writing C++ by value or Java or whatever. Of course, the contract I mentioned before, the immutability is only for the call. So now that mutation here is fine. I'm reassigning v1 to the result of offset. This is completely OK. The contract ended. Uh, and so we're, we're all good. And that print statement here is just to make sure that v1 is used uh, after the mutation. Otherwise, the compiler would complain. You're mutating a variable. It, it has to, to be unique because you have value semantics. So that mutation is useless if, if you don't use it. OK, like in Swift, I can use inout to make an in-place version of my offset. So 
nothing uh, very spectacular here. I have this in out uh, passing convention. Then I modify in place the, the, the two components of the vector. And again, there is kind of a contract between Cola and Coley. Now the contract says that the uh, value is uh, mutable and unique. And by unique, I mean that there are no other accessible reference to the referred storage uh, during the, uh, the call, mutable or otherwise. So you can't have a, a const uh, parameter, a let parameter, that would uh, refer to the same storage as v in that context. So it's perfectly safe here to change v, do whatever we want with v. V is definitely unique. So yeah, again, my attempt to do a transliteration. Again, I forgot the semicolon. Really not used to those. Uh, but yeah, that's C++ without the guarantees uh, added by VAR. And um, because we have moved semantics in VAR, uh, which is not the, uh, uh, which is kind of an improvement over Swift. Remember, uh, I said we want to deal with non-copyable types. The, um, remember, the contract says that the, the variable is, the, the, the in-out parameter is mutable and unique at the entry and exit of the function. But within the function, the call is uh, allowed to do whatever it wants. So I can make it escape. So here, that is kind of a silly instruction. It's just making v escape into nothingness. So really, it's destroying v here. This is a destructive move. Um, this is barely useful in practice, but it makes my point. V is not alive after that uh, instruction. That's completely fine, because I'm not violating the contract yet. The only thing I need to do is make sure I put the value back before uh, I return to, uh, to the caller. And so here, I can move something temporarily. So there is a kind of relationship between um, Sync and in out here, both relate to uh, uniqueness, but I'll come back to, to that later. Um, yep. A thing that you might miss if you're like, used to C++ is the compiler knows it's not alive, and you can't use it until you reassign. Yeah, yeah. so uh, in, in the previous example, trying to read V between the, the sinklet and, and uh, the reassignment here would be a type error. All right. OK, so let's call that function. And because I said sync parameters are related to, to escape, uh, to, to escape nest, then really they are moving the, the arguments in. So that means I cannot pass v1 both uh, uh, as the first and second arguments. It is, um, no, sorry, it's in out. Yeah, but same, same point here. Uh, I cannot pass uh, as, as uh, first and second argument. First argument here. I have this ampersand to mark the notation. It's not the address of operator. It's just a marker to say, hey, that argument might be mutated. So uh, when I read the code, then I, uh, read the code, then I can say, OK, here I need to be a bit careful. And because the contract says there cannot be another reference to, to that thing, mutable or otherwise, then this v1 here is, uh, this is a mistake. That code would be fine in Swift, because Swift would do an implicit copy here. But Copies that need to be explicit in that. But that's OK. The compiler is telling me to do that. And if I just follow the question, here is how I fix the example. Now it's fine. Why? Because I copy v1 before the call starts. And, and now the offset in place function gets uh, a copy of v1 for the d parameter and uh, an in-out version for the, uh, the first parameter. And I'm mutating v1. Sync parameters, I went a bit. Uh, too quickly, but sync parameters are related to uh, escaping, of course, just like the sync modifier we've seen before. So this function is just saying, I want the ownership of v. I want to take v in. And the code doesn't need to change from before, but we just know that v is unique inside that function. Uh, and as far as I can tell, this uh, would be uh, 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 R value reference. And this time, I didn't forget the semicolon. <laughs> for some reason. OK, so unsinkable here it is. Uh, I want to pass v1 as the first argument. And I didn't declare sync. Remember, we need to mark things that may escape. So again, I can follow the compiler suggestion. And here, what happens if I try to pass v1 as both the first and second argument, like I did before with the in-out version? What well, it fails? Why? Because 
Obviously, I moved v1 uh, into the call, so I cannot use it again after. So the solution is, again, you guessed it, an explicit copy. But if I do that explicit copy now, I'm hit with a warning that says, well, you declared the thing syncable, but it have actually never escaped. Mm -hmm. So just remove that capability. The idea here is to say, well, the compiler is very opinionated as well. And it says, don't give capabilities that you don't use. Re really use the minimum necessary. Um, what I wanted to say here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, does it warn that v1 after the assignment has not been synced in the previous slide? That v1 after the assignment hasn't been synced. Uh, no, it, it, so if we had that, which is a correct call here, it, it wouldn't, because you need to end v1 at some point. So and it only needs to happen once. Yeah, okay. yeah, it, it, because we are using the capability here. Implicitly, all variables need to end at some point. So. Well, but you do have, a, you do have a, an assignment that it can know you don't need, right? It would warn yeah, about here it would ah. warn for the assignment. That, that is correct, because I didn't have that print statement. Uh, at the end of the function. So sync applies on the function level, or do you have a smaller scope where it could apply, like a block? Uh, yeah, that. yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, it, I mean, yeah, it, any local variable mm -hmm. can be used by itself. But it, it's, it's a good question. We, we'll just come to that. So for the sake of consistency, we decided that sync parameters are immutable inside the, the function. But since we know they are unique, I can just move them to a local variable, right? Uh, and if I do that, then now we just have something mutable, right? And I can write the, well, it should be a multiplication. I'm sorry about that. It's an offset, not a scale. But uh, I could write the same kind of in-place version that I had before. So this really shows, as I said uh, uh, a while back, that there is a relationship between sync and uh, in-out. And in fact, that means both of these uh, uh, method, the in-place one and the sync one, can be synthesized from the other. And this is how we would do that. You don't have to read that code in detail. Just we are using the trick in the first one, the move to local variable, then do the in-place mutation. And in the second case, we are just saying, well, you can sync it uh, into the, the, the function and reassign it. That's a functional update uh, below. But we'll see how that is useful. And there is a fourth parsing convention, because we really want to have all the possibilities, uh, which is assign. And assign is a bit more niche, right? It's, it's like an in-out parameter. But the contract doesn't say that the, va the, the value is initialized at the beginning of the call. So it says it's not initialized. Yes, it's, it says it's not initialized. So really, it's, it's to initialize values with a function, we, it's called out parameters in some other languages. We'll see how that is useful when we talk about projections. But yeah, you, here you could like pass an uh, pointer to initialize data and, and try to initialize it. Okay, method bundles. Uh, so these passing conventions that we've seen, uh, uh, they are nice. They can convey intent, uh, which is, I think is an, uh, a nice property. But it also relates very strongly to performance. So my vec2 here is a very cheap type, right? It's just two numbers. I can copy it. Probably don't have noticeable performance impact if I do one copy uh, two more, too much. But let's say I have this polygon type here, which is much heavier, right? It's, an, uh, uh, it's composed of uh, an array, a collection of vertices. It could be maybe very big. And um, I have also offset. I define offset the same way, right, for the, the, the three versions, the, the led version, the in-place version, and the sync version. So now it, I need to be a bit careful about the, the version I use. Because if I use that one, for instance, here, so that's the led version, I have, uh, it's inefficient, right? There is an unnecessary allocation that will happen here. Why? Because I'm passing a, a reference, a const reference to the offset polygon, that, that shape here. This is. Remember, this is a, like a const reference. And so I need to create a new value that will be returned by the function, right? And so that means by the time I reach this point, I have two shapes in memory. One of those is completely useless. I could have just reused the storage I have already for shape 
and and do my offset there. So I could uh, should I use the in previous version? Okay, so how can um, yeah yeah uh, so that is an, an issue for the user, and some may object at this point because this is a classic use of a functional update, right? This is a functional update, and optimizer are they are good, they are powerful, they are probably able to handle that particular case, but this is very hard problem uh, in general to optimize, and people are still writing paper about that. So this is a 2017 paper about uh, trying to use destination passing style to optimize this kind of use case, and even even though it doesn't work in in all cases. So what I'm suggesting here is, if you use the in-place version, you don't even need an optimizer. It does the right the right thing. Um, the other problem we have uh, is, well, first the user needs to select the correct uh, implementation, but it's also difficult for uh, um, the library designer to to express the, those intent. I, I added in place, sync, et cetera. That's kind of a naming convention. Is it good? I don't know. Um, naming conventions don't always work. This is what has been done in, in Swift. Uh, Swift doesn't have the sync version, but it has the in out and the let version. And this is, for instance, some code that, that could work in Swift. This is, uh, I'm defining a set, putting some fruits in that set. And then I'm adding a durian to the set with union. Is it in place? Uh, I'm computing a new set and pressing. There's no real note. Uh, uh, we can't know by just looking at that, right? So, because so, uh, I think we have a moment. Um, so, the the naming conventions in Swift, you have like a sort function and a sorted function, right? So the sort function does the thing in place, and sorted gives you a new a new collection, right? And that. That works some of the time, but with things like union, it totally doesn't work. You can't say union, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, we ended up with form union for the in-place version. And and plus, you've got this overloading problem. Like, the semantics are, it's the same semantics. It's just a different packaging, right? So you want to document it once and have one thing. Yeah, right. Thanks, Dave. So yeah, the naming conventions are not that great. So the reflex in C++ is probably to think about overloading. But yeah, we said we don't want overloading. Uh, this is evil. So instead of that, we will just steal the idea of grouping setters and getters in Swift, and we will create this kind of bundle. Now, I have all the implementations of that offset met method for a vector that are just grouped into a single declaration. And now I have only one declaration, only one signature, and only one documentation. So kind of solve the use case Dave was mentioning before. Yeah. How do I? How do you test this? Test this? Yes. Yeah, you just. You, uh, get the, you get the the cost that you're expecting. Yeah, so it. Um, I come to that. Because I've grouped all these declarations together, now I can teach the compiler about the relationship between those. So this is giving uh, the compiler an opportunity to choose the right implementation. So how do I test it? I just create the right context for the, the, the specific implementation to be used. So for instance, here, which one should be used? Well, this is the, this is the last use of the, the argument here. right? This is just uh, uh, the, the argument doesn't leave after that call. So I will use the sync version. Well, the compiler will use the sync version. I don't need to say anything. The compiler will use the sync version directly because it can notice that this argument here, this is a, just a value created by, remember the, 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 the version we had before, is going directly into the call. So it's using the sync version. And what if I want to use, oh, yeah, and as I said before, it can be, the sync version can be synthesized from the in-out version. So I can mm -hmm. remove that implementation here, and the compiler provide it for free, right? Because it's, oh, OK, I can use the in-out version. Maybe you have a handwritten way to provide a better version. That's, that's why you want to have the three. But otherwise, you can just let the compiler synthesize for you. And what if I want to call the in-out version? Well, if we have this notation here, the dot followed by an equal, this 
resembles uh, a bit like self-assignment, and so that is an in-place offset of my vector. Yeah? How do you know which parameter the parameter passing directive let in and out of flight is? Here there's only one parameter, but if you have a function of multiple parameters? Yeah, the parameters are declared here, right? This is, this is like a regular method declaration, and I have one parameter, I could have a, a list of fifty. Uh, yeah, I, I can clarify, sorry. The, that, those qualifiers letting in and out apply to the, to the self, in this case, the target. Ah, yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is a method, right? And we have a way to, you can also annotate those other parameters with, with uh, features, but that, that's not a variable across which we, we needed to. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention. I said I use three functions to show how the passing convention work and how they relate to the receiver. Well, this is just annotating the receiver, really. All right. So what about local bindings? So the key observation that is at the heart of Val is that one way to think about uh, local lead bindings uh, is to see them as lead par methods. So once you get into these mindsets, um, local, binding can be, local bindings can be understood as a continuation. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at this program. I have a function here that's called print first vectex. It takes a polygon and it prints the, the first vectex of the polygon for, for some reason. And well, what happens if I want to do that? I want to create a local binding get the first vectex and then print it. It's basically the same thing. Well, this is actually really the same thing. So I could say I can replace that function by that. And what, what does that mean? It means that now first vectex is like the parameter I had before. And all the contracts and all the stuff that I've been talking be, uh, about, like uh, it kind of changed during the, the call, et cetera. Well, now it's the same. So. Okay, back up and show the, show the function that's grayed out again. Okay, so shape is, is passed by let, right? Which, because that's the default passing convention. Mm -hmm. And what we said is that that's like a const ref mm -hmm. in C++ with some more guarantees, right? And so, so you can view everything, uh, everything after, you can view that call to print first vertex as, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain this. Um, uh, Equivalent to being written in line? Yeah, uh, so, so it, there will be some oh, animation, yeah, so make it, it clear it, later, right? I, I see, you're not showing the continuation in that. Case. Yeah, it, okay. it, it, it will. You're gonna, you're gonna show I, I'm gonna, I'm right, gonna show it, but okay, for, for now, let's just assume that this led vertex, that the, this local by that will appear, is the same as the argument that I take here, right? Let's, let's just assume that it works like that, okay? So really, we're just reusing John McCall's idea. We we want to avoid creating this uh, use of functions all the time to to apply the guarantees we have on the, the the parameters. We want to be able to to do that more in a direct inline style. So. Yeah, here I'm mutating the vertices after. This is fine because now the, this LED parameter here, let's assume it's a LED parameter, the, no longer is in use. So why, why does that work? And why does that doesn't work? It relates to the contract, right? When I create the local binding on first vertex, I'm creating this LED parameter, and it needs to satisfy the contract for the duration of the call. So what is the duration of the call? Well, it's the use, the lifetime of that local binding. So here, that is a mistake. Why? Because that's, uh, sorry, that lifetime is defined from here to here, to the last use of this parameter, which, which coincide with the, the last instruction of the function. So I cannot mutate shape during that because that would violate the contract. And this is how I said before, it's a contract between caller and callee. Well, the caller cannot really mutate anything, but here it, it, it could, right? Because now the caller becomes intermingled with the, with the callee. And so the caller said, well, okay, during 
the lifetime of this LED parameter, I will not mutate the, 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 the thing that you are uh, referring to. What happens, oh, of course, we can have in-out local bindings as well. So the same as in-out parameters, and they have the same kind of constraints. So here I say in my first vectex e in-out, and rather than just printing it, I want to apply this offset function right, with the uh, in-place uh, notation that we've seen before. And of course, that works here. Uh, the contract now is an in-out contract. It says that uh, it is uh, unique and mutable for the, duration, for the lifetime, which is until that print statement here, and all is great. All right. So we've seen here uh, use of these copies, explicit copies, the thing, and everything. But, and that's nice for optimization, for intents, all this stuff. But not everyone cares about tight optimization all the time. I'm sure some of you have used scripting languages to design an algorithm before you implement them efficiently in C++. And as we've seen with the diagnostics the compiler provides, I think we have a pretty good story to guess what should have been done. It's a bit like in Rust, right? We are trying to guess what you uh, what, what is the error and what is the fix, and we wanted a way to provide that automatically to the user. So they don't have to compile, fail, apply the fix. So let's say I have here this uh, uh, extension of vect vector. I, I define a new constructor and, and a method to convert a vector to a buffer, again, using extension like in Swift, and inval this will fail, right? Because here I'm trying to escape uh, values, and this requires explicit copies. So the compiler will complain, you, may, you need to make an explicit copy here, I can do the fix, but let's say I don't want to write the dot copy everywhere, and I trust the compiler. So I can use that directive here that says, well, I trust you, Every, everywhere you think you need to add a dot copy, just go ahead, right? And so the compiler now is satisfied. It says, yeah, okay, you, need, you, you forgot the copy, but you told me to go ahead, and that's what I will do. Notice that the directive is scoped, right? So that means it doesn't affect that function, uh, which is um, another offset. I really like offsets. Uh, here, this is, this is a, an error, right? V should, uh, should be copied. Uh, but OK, I can do the copy explicitly, or I can move the directive one scope up. And now it applies more globally. There is another mistake. Yeah. Uh, this is the scope of the file here. Is implicit copy specific to implicit copies on VEC2, or no, uh, the copy anything in this file? Anything in this file. Yeah, so we, we have thoughts about a way to get that functionality, too. It's a simple variation, but yeah. You could declare implicit copy VEC2, or implicit copy some trait. Mm -hmm. So you say everything. That, that is you know, no more expensive than a, an atomic increment if you label your, uh, label, you know, your, your types that way, you could say. Yeah. This uh, can be copied explicitly. So. Exactly. Thank you, Dave. Forgot to mention that. Um, there's another mistake in this offset x function. Uh, maybe by now you're val experts and, and you guess what it is. Sure, I cannot make that v2 escape. Right, it's unsinkable. <laughs> uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So why don't return variables just implicitly syncable? Because when you return, uh, uh, why return variables are not explicitly syncable? Implicitly syncable. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Uh, there, there is a kind of back and forth with that. Dave, Dave is saying, well, it sounds like an inconvenience. I would l l want to use the directive that I was uh, getting at here, this implicit sync everywhere. The reason is when I started to write some val code, uh, trying to uh, prototype a uh, certain library, I realized that it's sometimes difficult to know what is uh, uh, syncable and what isn't. And reasoning about your code becomes a bit difficult in certain situations. I'm not completely sold that we still need the capability. Um, I will lean toward a yes. Maybe with more usage, we will realize that it's not necessary 
So good question. It's a design trade-off. I don't have a definite answer. We're, that's where we're at. Yeah, I, I think we will see once we write more code. All right, and there is a, a last uh, directive I want to talk about. Uh, actually, I've assumed that this directive was used everywhere in the example. It's at implicit public. And I said we have a very simple access model. So the access model is just, if you're public, you are visible one scope up. If you're not, you're, you're private, and you are not visible outside the, the, the dimension scope. There is nothing more. No protected, no other, yeah, you don't know Swift, but Swift has file private, uh, and, and many other crazy things, just that. And this implicit public say, well, let's say all declarations are public. I don't want to care about that. I'm just scripting some stuff. I don't want to care about access level. All right, projections. Um, we use the term let, uh, we use that term projections to call the let and in out bindings or parameters because they really project a value into a coli or a non lexical lifetime. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it exposes an object or a sub-object, sub and it, it's preserving the value semantics properties, right? So, thinking back about what we said, what they've said about Swift subscript and computed properties, there's no, no reason why this projection cannot be synthesized, and there's no real reason they they cannot span several statements. So in Swift, they, they are limited to one statement, right? So sub-expression, a subscript is a sub-expression, or computer property is a sub-expression. But here we see that we generalize a little on what a parameter is. We say, well, any local binding is like a parameter. So maybe we can do that for a subscript as well. So let me introduce this type, angle. We're seeing the math here. Uh, I tinted uh, this presentation with, with my love for computer graphics. And we have like a computed property. So I, I fought a, a lot for a different keyword because uh, I, I didn't like var in Swift. Anyway, so it's called a, a property here. And we have also this idea of grouping the accessors together, but we just have different accessors. So the let accessor, you guessed it, it's like a let parameter, uh, same stuff. Um, and here is how I use it. Nothing amazing here, just use it uh, as an expression, nothing, nothing too out of the blue. Um, in out, exactly the same as uh, modify in Swift, right? So we even kept the yield. We can compute some value before, project the value out, and then uh, do something after the yield to uh, reassign myself. Assign, a bit more useful here, right? So assign, remember, it's like an in out parameter, but the value is not initialized when we at uh, the start of the call. So what does it mean here is that I can use that to write a setter, a Swift setter. And why is it useful? Well, I'm just want, uh, I just want to assign a value here. I uh, write a new value in, 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 my, in my angle. So there is no reason I synthesized one before, just inefficient, right? I don't need to produce a value that it's not used at all, just discarded right away. So Yes. Well, it's just sort of the default name for the, for the setting, the incoming parameter for set. I don't see. It. I don't see declared. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not declared. It's it's the implicit name of the the value that comes in. Okay. You can you can customize it if you want, but if you it's it turned out when I was writing Swift that I wanted the the name new value so often that it was like it was stupid for me to to write it. And, it yeah. So it's known by the compiler. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why yield in let instead of a return? Ah, okay, because, good question. Uh, why yield with the let version? Because we are not returning something, right? We are projecting something out. Uh, we will go back to the accessor after, after that. Uh, the idea is when you return a value, you are producing a new value and you are giving up the ownership of that value. You are saying, well, here is a new value. Do whatever you want with that. Escape. It can escape, yeah. And here, in that particular example, I could return. But uh, let's say you, you want to project the, an, an element in a vector of non-copyable uh, things. Yeah, you, you cannot return them. You can project them, but you cannot return them. So yeah, assign and finally sync. So sync here can be underst uh, understood as 
I want to sync the, the, the receiver, so my angle, because I want to produce a new value out. Right? So here I'm returning a value. But why can I do that? Because I'm destroying the receiver. So going back to the array of non-copyable thing example, maybe on my last dying breath, I can produce an element and then destroy the remainder of the vector. We can synthesize the in-out version from let n assign, right? Because if I have a way to produce a value and a way to uh, assign a value, then I can produce in-out. We need to cheat a little with the type system because we need to convince the type system that it's OK to project something mutably here, although I, project, uh, I produce that value with an immutable projection. This is fine in that particular case because if I can use the in-out accessor, that means the value uh, on which I'm using the, the accessor has to be unique. But Sorry, where is the immutable projection you're talking about? So it's, it's that D is a let. Let D uh, equal, equal degree here is a let projection. Mm -hmm. And I'm convincing the, uh, the, the type checker to, yeah, it's, it's fine here. So, so that, why didn't you just declare it var? Because if you declared var, you need to make it escape. So it wouldn't escape. You cannot declare in out because. Uh, all right. We, we, yeah. might to, yeah. we might need to negotiate over that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. We'll yeah, negotiate. This is a work in progress. It's, so. Yeah, it's a work in progress. But OK, anyway, you don't need to care that much about that. The important thing is we can synthesize some parts, uh, some accessors. Uh, we need to cheat a bit. Uh, I can do that in the compiler, but unfortunately, the user can't. Uh, um, an alternative could have been to have a get accessor like the Swift one that produce a new value, uh, that really produce a new value, not by consuming one, so not the sync accessor. But there is an overlap if I do that, if we do that with just functions. So it's a design trade off. It was a... All right, moving on. Subscript. So we wanted to also generalize on subscript. So we took Swift subscript and we made a few. Uh, uh, improvements. First, they can have a name. And they can be not a member of something. And they can be, yeah, free subscript. So here, this min subscript uh, has a name. So I can use it like a function. And because we can span over multiple statements, we need also a way to tell the compiler which of the arguments need to be involved in the contract. Right? So we have this out convention. And the out convention is just whatever has been used to uh, create the subscript. We will see uh, an example. So here for this subscript, I have a let accessor, an in-out accessor. Now uh, we know how it works. And so let's use that subscript. I have two vectors, and then I create here, uh, I, I project the, the shortest vector using the norm to compare them. And so because A and B are marked out parameters, those are part of the contract, but not the closure, because the closure is not marked out. So that means the contract here only relates to A and B. I, can, I could do whatever I want with the closure. I could make it escape or whatever. Could, could you spend a little bit more time on that slide? That was sure. a lot of code at the end. Sure. Yeah, sorry. I, I thought there was an animation. Um, so yeah, they're creating two vectors, then calling the subscript. The syntax to call subscript is with the square bracket, because it's, it's a subscript. And here, I want to create an in-out local binding. Right? vmin is uh, an in-out local binding. So calling subscript with v1 and v2. So that binds vmin to the, the least of these two vectors. Exactly. This is, this is a closure syntax we have in val. It's a bit different from Swift, but probably uh, uh, relatively intuitive. Then this vmin here is really the list of the two vector. I'm changing the x component and printing v2. And in that particular case, uh, yeah, v2 is the same, so it doesn't uh, it, it forget about the print. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a mistake. It should have been v1. I wanted to say it's v1, and then you would see that v1 has x is now to the 5, right? So the out It depends on uh, it. No, no, sorry. You're, we, we also have to talk about the name of out. I came up with that, but it's misleading. It doesn't mean 
it's it doesn't mean what you're what you're thinking it doesn't mean an uninitialized thing coming in that that the current term for that is an assigned parameter this what this means is a binding between the lifetime and the mutability of those input things and the result so right it says that that while you're holding v min you don't get to uh, you, you don't get to modify v1 or v2 for example yeah bo both are considered being projected or even look at them or even look at them because it's an in out so it ties it ties the parameters to the duration of the return loop yes. yeah Exactly. You can think of out as just a placeholder for let or in out in that case because these are the subscripts I have declared. And it depends on how I use it. Here I use it with in out, so both are substituted by in out. Uh, there was a question here. I, 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 sorry. Um, what's, the, what's the advantage here of using subscripts over just uh, a regular function? Yeah, so good question. Why, what's the advantage of subscripts over functions in that particular case? Subscript related to projections. So if I use a subscript, I will project values. If I use a, a function, I will produce new values that may escape. Right? So it, here I could have a mean function that takes two uh, vectors and return a new vector that would be the least of the two. Right? Let, let me help quickly. The, so as you remember, properties are a special case of subscript. Right? They're, they're the parameterless, a parameterless subscript. And, and those have certain, uh, so, so those have this projection quality. And, uh, and when I was working on Swift, it, one of the things that always became an issue is like, how do I decide whether to code this as a property or as a function that takes no parameters, as a method that takes no parameters? And there was, you know, I, I wanted to say, well, okay, at least it, it can't be a property if it's not a one, but I lost that battle, unfortunately. Um, but but anyway, the criterion is fuzzy. And the, the nice thing about saying properties and subscripts are projections and functions create new values is that it totally clarifies which one you want. So that's why. Um, so is this? Out decorator thing is it kind of like like Rust's like scope like lifetime annotations that they put with their parameters and tie it to the input? Yeah, it, yes, it is. It is very similar to Rust lifetime annotations. The difference is we don't need to name them um, because the, the lifetime is attached the, to the result value. The, yeah, and. We lose some expressiveness here compared to Rust uh, without going too much into the details. Uh, there is some expression loss, but yeah, I, I, I come to that in in, in the next slide. We see uh, better. I think it's a good trade off. Yeah. All right. So moving on. Stored projections. Sometimes it's useful to encapsulate a projection into something else when when you want to project it. We've seen that example with the slices uh, uh, that Dave showed with the the vector. So how do we do that in Val? So where well, here I have a slightly simpler example than the slices. I want to get the minimum element of an array. And well, maybe that array is empty. So I will return an optional uh, instead of uh, to represent the fact that, well, if the array is empty, you cannot get the min minimum element. So very easy. If the, uh, the array is empty, I return nil. But what happens if I want to project an element out? Well, I cannot make escape the things of the array into my variant because maybe the array is an array of non-copyable stuff. Here, I didn't say anything about array. I could make maybe a conditional extension, but that's not what I've done here. So when I do that, really, I, I can't make it escape. So the, the solution is to make a stored projection. It's like, well, take that projection and store it inside another type. So that notation here is saying, this is a variant that contains a stored projection, so not an element a store projection of an element. And so now when I yield self uh, subscript i, I'm yielding a projection of self subscript i. What results here is a variant that is non-copyable and immovable. So it's really like, if you know a bit of Rust, this is really like 
storing a borrow inside a struct. We don't have name lifetimes, so it's a bit simpler. But what we lose is I can only do that trick at initialization. I can only store prediction at the initialization of an object, and I cannot reassign them uh, whatsoever. Yeah. And so that's the trade off we have. Um, here's how I can use it, right? Um, so, yeah, as, as I said, they are, like, they are like Rust, but they form a whole path relationship. There is no spe special syntax to access them, right? Uh, we don't need to dereference the projection. And, yeah, no last time annotations, I already talked about that. Uh, I will go very quickly over that. Um, they've already talked about it. It's the um, ambiguity between projections and functions. What should be a function? What should be a projection? Well, that dot, sorry, dot here is a function. It produces a new value. It's like a computation. Rotated. Uh, it's, it, maybe it could be a projection, right? You could rotate thing, uh, rotate the vector, scale it, and then scale it back. There are better ways to express transformations in computer graphics. So, debatable transpose, better use case, right? In computer graphics, we often transpose things, do some stuff, transpose it back. OK, might be tempted to use uh, a projection. Um, and what about that? Uh, this is like a view of my vector. I want to view it as a different type. Uh, here, yeah, I, I created a property, so a projection. I think it makes sense. Uh, I'm just viewing the exact same data just with a different type, but it's the same layout. And notice that here is an example of how I can build safe APIs on top of unsafe APIs. So we have C-like pointers uh, in, in Val. They are called this, uh, uh, this pointer. Accessing the value being pointed is an unsafe operation, which is why you, you see this unsafe here. But I carefully written that the code so that satisfies valid environments. So using that uh, property here is perfectly safe. So that's a, that's a way to build safe APIs on top of OSIMFIX. Of course, again, it's taken from Swift. Uh, very quickly, what's the story for Generix? Very similar to Swift. Basically, we're just filling some gaps. Um, scoped conformances, long overdue. That paper is from 2005. Uh, the, the idea is just that you can make a type conform to a trait in a limited scope. Method aliases. Finally, a way to resolve the uh, infamous uh, multiple inheritance problem. You, you inherit from uh, different protocols. Uh, they define method with the same name. Ah, how does that work? Well, we can make aliases for that. Also, uh, an old paper. Non-type genetic parameters. Well, you know them. You have them in C++. We're trying to see how we could use that for metaprogramming, but it's an ongoing investigation. Support for specialization uh, using extensions as custom customization point. Story is very similar to Swift, but we want to use monomorphization to avoid late binding. Uh, and variadic parameters, this is really a uh, work in progress. Uh, we need to see how that will interact with metaprogramming. We don't have a clear answer yet. Last thing I want to touch is concurrency. This was one of the first thing I, I put in Val, and uh, now we need to revisit them with the projects and everything. But the, the basic stuff is a uh, very simple model. We have async here that just launches a, a process, uh, uh, a task asynchronously. It can be just, it can be any closure, just an expression, a couple of statements, can be anything. This produces a future. You can await the future when you need the result, and that's it. Uh, safety follows from value semantics. Remember, we don't have references, so no data race uh, here. Very simple stuff. Uh, but a lot of questions about how we should implement that. What's a programming model? What's the uh, how we sh should encode blocking? Uh, is it a naming convention eh, uh, in the type system? Mm. There are some trade-offs. We are working on that. And well, that's it. Um, how real is Val? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we are still working on implementation. So my brain is the only truly formed. Vile compiler out there. Uh, Dave is working on his own. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're progressing on that. Dave convinced me to write a specification. So I read C++ specification, tried to understand how it works, and, <laughs> and, 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 
This is amazing. And replicates. No, no languages have specifications like the, like C plus plus may be a mess in what it's actually specifying, but the spec for C plus plus is amazing, like the the detail and rigor, and and that Dimitri actually followed that to produce this thing is. Like, I can't say enough. It's just yeah, I, I concur. It's, uh, from an outsider, it, it, it's actually readable. Uh, it, it's dense, but it's readable. Uh, maybe I'm biased. I, I read semantics all the time. But anyway, uh, everything is open source. Um, big project for us. So bombard us with questions uh, afterwards, Dave and I. Uh, happy to answer about this. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Really amazing opportunity to give that talk. Thank you very much.